it is a huge, extreme honor to be interviewing one of the biggest legends I've ever met, Ron Jackson. I mean, uh, basically, you and Dickerson and Hornbrook basically are probably going to be credited for starting the whole cosmetic revolution. Uh, LVI was started in 95. You were the first uh, big key name they brought on it the year after 96. And I mean, from 96 when you started to probably the NASDAQ, peak of the NASDAQ in 2000, it would, dentistry could only be summed up in two words, in one word, cosmetic. It was the birth of the AECD. It was the cosmetic revolution. And on that <coughs> entire cosmetic revolution, it was you and Dickerson that pretty much led the whole thing. Uh, maybe if a company had to get credit for some of that, it's probably Ivaclare. They were probably behind that 110%. Yeah. So, uh, so, so now it's 2015. Um, LVI was started in 95, you started in 96. So what do you think of the cosmetic revolution now that it's 20 years past? It, it, we're in the second generation. Uh, you, you, there's dentists graduating that were just pretty much born uh, right when it started. So what, what do you think of the cosmetic revolution? Well, it, it's still going. I mean, there, there are people that want to enhance their smile and enhance their appearance, and it, and it, and it gives them... Um, uh, psychological self-esteem uh, you know we all want to look our best and so that aspect of it is still there now you hear about the economy and you know because you're you're the MBA guy here um, uh, it certainly did slow down during during uh, uh, tougher tougher economic times but doesn't go away uh, it comes back people can table it because it's elective so that's what the definition of cosmetic dentistry is it's 100 percent elective so it's not needs based from the standpoint of, of, of disease, uh, but aesthetic restorative dentistry. And let's talk about that because that is now what defines dentistry. And, and the reason why I suggested posterior composites as a, as a topic is because um, that, that embodies uh, aesthetic uh, restorative dentistry. It's needed restorative dentistry, has a lot of benefits, the adhesion technology, adhesion revolution. And, you know, we talk about the aesthetic revolution. Uh, you could just as easily say the adhesion revolution. They kind of started at the same time when we were able to bond to dentin um, in there. And so, so today, uh, restorative dentistry has transitioned into aesthetic restorative dentistry. So it's restorative dentistry, it's needed, but it looks good. Um, and you get the advantages of, of a conservative preparation because uh, you, you can't pick up a journal, a magazine, anything. Even your dental town uh, talks about minimally invasive dentistry, MID. Uh, there's an organization um, based on this whole concept, and that's what the adhesion revolution allowed us to do. And working with composite, I just want to say this one thing about, and then we can take it wherever you want to go, but this is a good introduction. Uh, working with composite, you know, our, our profession tends to disagree on a lot of things, uh, very controversial, uh, just about everything. Uh, people have differences of opinion on, but one thing the whole profession agrees on, Howard, and that is that the most conservative restoration that can be done in dentistry, whether it be anterior or posterior, is direct resin. Um, and so that's why this uh, uh, this restorative has uh, has become so prominent. I, I don't know whether you know this statistic or not, but and um, and Gordon quotes this. Uh, he had it in one of his articles that in 1990, why 94 percent of dentists used amalgam. Um, whereas in by 2010, this is United States statistics, by the way, and they come from. Um, um, a dental consultant uh, Lamoli in, in Atlanta, uh, but so 1990, 94% used uh, amalgam by 2010, posterior composite restorations exceeded amalgam by a ratio of two to one, and a third of dentists don't use it at all anymore. Now, I'm not saying amalgam is dead, uh, you know, that I'm not, I'm not going to even badmouth amalgam, that's, that's, that's ridiculous, it served our profession well for 100 years, and, and it's still around, and it will still be around for a while, although in a greater decline, probably what's stopping it from declining even faster is um, the fact that it's, uh, it's much easier and forgiving than placing posterior uh, composites. Um, if posterior composites were uh, faster and easier and more predictable, uh, less time-consuming, less tedious to place, 
why um, I, you would see amalgam pretty much disappear uh, because it has drawbacks like corrosion and expansion and uh, and of course it's not aesthetic uh, but it has some some advantages and so if we can develop a technique and uh, that allows us to place a posterior composite at the same time and as easy and as predictable as amalgam why then that would that that's pretty much going to do it um, and we're getting closer to that Howard uh, there's been a big uh, movement in this regard not just from the adhesive, adhesive standpoint the matrixing standpoint but also from uh, new composites specifically developed for posterior use and by that I'm talking about the bulk fills I want to I want to back up a little bit and first of all say that um you know I've always thought mental health was more important than oral health and I think one thing the cosmetic revolution gave us the most is when people cover their mouth and they smile and they don't like their teeth and whatever they don't take care of them all right but if they love their fishing boat or their bowling ball they'll polish it every day you're right and when people get a nice truck that they love they go out there every Sunday and wash it with a bucket of water and I've seen more people that after they got bleaching or bonding or veneers or ortho or braces or whatever they were the most faithful people getting their teeth clean brushing and flush so I think the human condition is you're either in or out yes. and, when they, and when they don't like something about you know whatever they, I mean they, they either you know they're, they're in or out and um, I so I, I want to start with um the um the, well the funny thing about amalgam the reason i don't like bad mouth and amalgam is because um, we forget that there's seven billion people on earth and that three billion people live in less than three dollars a day and mm. i've i've been to countries in africa where if you're going to take away amalgam and when when people bad mouth it and they're in rich countries like geneva switzerland right and it's like dude have you ever been to tanzania have you ever been to Tanzania? Are you kidding no. me? Uh, no, I mean, I'm talking about these dentists, you know, in, oh, in yes. rich countries, bad-mouthing amalgam. Yeah. So it's no. market segmentation. For every Lamborghini, someone's going to take the bus. And, right. uh, and so, so it's all in between. So, but humans tend to be extremists. You almost never find a moderate. But, um, but Ron, I, uh, <clears throat> so let's start with the, um, you said something very profound that the, the bonding revolution started with the cosmetic revolution. They and uh, I think we're on right now. What generation of bonding agent are we on right now? Eight hundred and forty-seven yeah, or nine hundred and twelve? What a so ridiculous term! <laughs> to talk in terms of generation. I, I, I've, I, I'm totally against using that terminology. Those are marketing words, Howard, to make dentists feel like the, you know, a company comes out with a tenth generation, and the dentist says to myself, "Oh my God, I'm on the fourth. I'm, I'm that far behind. I better, I better <laughs> buy this tenth. So it's a marketing word, uh, and and I I suggest in my lectures on adhesive dentistry that we that we get that word out of our vocabulary and talk about whether something is is an etch and rinse or a self etch or now the new class of adhesives which is called universal, and that, okay. that's it. Well, Ron, I think if anybody if, if you had to be known for I mean you're you're known as the cosmetic dentist you're known as the real world dentist I, I think it's just cooler in hell that you've done all this while just practicing in Middleburg, Virginia. And, one stop uh, light town. A one stop light town. And what I think is even cooler, dude, is I'm 52 and you're 68 and you're still doing it because you love it and you look younger than I do and you'll probably uh, you'll probably <laughs> I go think to it's the hair though. <laughs> you'll probably go to my funeral and uh, so you know I just think it's so damn cool because you have yeah. enough money you could have retired 10 years ago and yeah. here you are 68 you you're not doing it for money uh, yeah. you're doing it for love. So I, I but but what you're even more known for is again instead of just the cosmetic revolution being veneers on the front on pretty girls you just said in your opening that you applied cosmetic dentist to restorative dentistry in the posterior so mm -hmm. my first question to you um uh, is uh walk us through that the, the first thing um and, and remember uh tomorrow night i'm going to a graduation deal at at still you know five thousand kids are coming out of dental school my, my first question to you is um diagnosis and treatment planning when when would you do a direct filling when would you do an indirect and then walk us through those techniques of a direct versus indirect. And if, and if you can, they want to know exactly what you're using. If you could name your bonding agent or your material, because uh, that's the number one complaint I get. Well, he said uh, he does this, but he, didn't, he said a microfill, but he didn't say what brand. Well, wow. yeah. Well, uh, in terms of diagnosis, the, the, that that uh, that that bar that bar is being moved. Um, our materials, our direct materials, now are are so good. They've reached a level where they wear 
similar or even better than amalgam. And so consequently, fracture toughness, flexural strength, uh, uh, density uh, is, is reached the point now where there's, there's so much better. So what I'm getting at is it, there's really almost no size uh, uh, restoration. There's a, there, 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 like there used to be, you used to say that if the isthmus width of the cavity was more than one third the buccal lingual width of the tooth, you really should think indirect. Um, and now that's not true. I'm doing far fewer inlays. Now that's not to say that I'm not doing inlays. There's other con clinical conditions uh, greater than normal intertooth distance and, and various things that would require me to do inlays. Basically now, when I'm going indirect, it'd be more like onlays and things. When, when you start to replace cusps, um, that's when uh, creating the correct amount of, of contours, um, pit and fissure grooves, uh, uh, contact, uh, all those factors that go into developing a, a quality uh, replacement of the missing tooth. Because remember, these things, we're not just doing fillings. Uh, posterior, we, these things have to function, and, and uh, triangular ridges and proper marginal ridges, functional stops, the occlusal anatomy is all critically important to goes to function. That's by definition what a restoration is. It a restoration is by definition replaces the form and the original condition. So if you just stick a blob of composite and, and fill this gigantic hole and when after you've done the tap tap grind grind tap tap grind grind you've got nothing but a flat surface with with no proper contours or anatomy you see, what I'm getting at is once you start replacing custom walls, um, that's when you start thinking indirect. There's still a, a, a powerful place for, for indirect uh, onlays, and onlays are more conservative than crowns. Um, I consider indirect aesthetic onlays, whether it be ceramic or indirect uh, composite, uh, to be almost the Rodney Dangerfield restoration in dentistry. They don't get any respect. Um, and, but they, they should be done more often than, say, full crowns. Um, and, and where that line is today, you start out by saying, you know, where do you stop doing directs and where do you pick up do, going indirect? Uh, that's where um, I think it, it goes, where, what I apply anyway, and it's different for different people, but I would apply it whenever I'm replacing a, a, a major cusp in a molar. You know, a minor cusp I wouldn't worry about, but major cusps, that's when I feel that I can deliver a better restoration, um, a more properly contoured restoration. Let's face it, when the technician is working calmly on mounted models at the bench, without the time constraints that you and I have at the chair, they can create the kind of functional anatomy that's required for posterior teeth for people to, to chew with them. And, and so that's, that's really the issue. I, I can't give you a, a, a specific percentage of two structure missing, and this is when you go indirect, and this is when you stay direct. That, that's, that, that, that's never going to work now, and so I hope I've answered your question. Does it make sense what I, what I said? It, it does make sense. So let's, let's start with uh, one of those. Let, let's go through both of those techniques. So let's uh, start with the far, far, far more common, which is a direct. Yeah. There's probably 10 directs for every indirect. Um, so so um, it's a, the most common tooth to get an MOD uh, anything or a crown or missing or an implant is a first molar. So it's a it's number it's a first molar um, and it's got a huge uh, uh, in, to and it needs a big MOD. Yeah. And you're going to go direct. I'm so, going to go direct. You want to know my material my materials and step by step how yeah, I go through that yeah, process. Yeah, and, and 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 go in more details because some of the uh, some of the things. Uh, um, you know, just going by controversies, uh, um, some people swear by rubber dams. Some people say I can do it with a, uh, um, with a, uh, isolate. Some people say mm -hmm. I don't need it. Young kids tend to think only old guys like us need loops that they're, they're 25. They're looking at some older guys saying, well, yeah, you got, you don't have any hair and you're old and you're senile. You need <laughs> loops. I don't need them. I'm 25. I can see. So would you, would you use a rubber dam? Would you use yes. loops? Well, absolutely loops, and I go further than, than, than loops. I, I want to have a, a fiber optic LED headlight on me as well. Back to the mouth, it, 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 trying to see back there, and it has nothing to do with young versus old. Uh, name me a surgeon working in a small area. 
name you any surgeon working in a small area that doesn't wear magnification. You won't find a, 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 a physician, surgical physician, working in a small area without magnification. And, and we should be using it too. And it, besides that, it's not only good that you can see uh, into small areas, and when you see what you're doing, you can do a better job. That's just bottom line. Uh, but the other thing is, at the end of the day, you know, you're not as stressed out when you're trying to strain and see back there. And it's the same thing with a fiber optic LED light. And the nice thing about it, when you're doing composites in the posterior, you know, it, it, where, there, where the light is a premium, you can't see, you bring your dental light down and it tends to set up your composite prematurely. So if you are wearing a fiber optic LED light with a filter on it, you're going to have much more illumination and be able to see. I turn my dental unit light off, so that, that covers the visual aspects of it. And again, at the end of the day, uh, your back is not as tired, your eyes aren't as strained, um, and you also can feel better about your dentistry because you can see what you're doing. Uh, our type of work doesn't lend itself to a Braille approach. I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, now, as far as rubber dam is concerned, um, I know that uh, it's 50% uh, of dentists don't use it. I know that most dentists would rather walk on hot coals and bare feet than to put a rubber dam on. I use it. I use it because it's simpler, it's faster, it's easier, and it's an absolute. I, I, I want the lips, the tongue, the cheek. Uh, I want to open up that quadrant. My, I can see, my assistant can see, when she can see, she can assist me better. Um, I, I, it's expediency. Besides that, uh, I, I don't have to worry about contamination during the process. Now, I, I know all these other things, the isolate and everything else is, is probably uh, very commonly used. Certainly, it's better than cotton rolls. Uh, and there's alternatives out there um, that, that people use. The, the key is you've got to have isolation. Adhesion uh, requires isolation. And, and, and I don't like you know, playing games or, or worrying about it. And when I put a rubber dam on, it's out of the picture. MOD. Well, after you've prepared this uh, cavity, which of course is a nice thing about uh, composite again, I go back to the one of the benefits of composite is there's no required preparation geometry like there is with with non-adhesive or uh, dentistry, like amalgam, where you have to use your uh, undercuts, you have to create uh, dovetails, and you have to do all these kinds of things, mechanical locks. You don't do that with adhesive dentistry. You take out uh, the, the, the old uh, restorative. If there's one there, you take out the disease, and what's left is your prep. And so after we've got that done, I like using uh, sectional matrices. Now, there's two of them out there. Um, uh, that are outstanding. Uh, uh, these are, uh, and neither of these companies invented the sectional matrix. What they did is they perfected it. One is Garrison uh, Compositite System, and the other one is Triodent, the V3 system. Now, the Triodent system is marketed and sold in the United States by Ultradent. Oh, um, really? They're, they're Australian company. So they're, they're an, well, no, it's a New Zealand. Oh, company. New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it's a New Zealand company, but Ultradent distributes their product here in the United States. Densply also has a, um, um, a, a matrix like, or a sectional matrix system as well, but I think that Triodent's making it for them and, uh, uh, and they're selling it as well. Um, it, and where, it, where's Garrison out of? Garrison, I believe they're Indiana. They're a father-son yeah. dentist. And, and by the way, the other system, Triodent in um, um, New Zealand, New Zealand it, it was founded by a dentist. Dentists are very clever, and uh, as a general rule, they oftentimes, um, uh, you know, not myself, I, I tend to steal ideas, but uh, people that create them, uh, very clever. They see a problem, and, and, and as I said, they didn't invent the sectional matrix system, but both companies really perfected it. You just can't miss a, a contact. If people are having trouble with contact, they should really look at one or the other of those two systems. You can't use them 100% of the time, though, about 90% of the time. I, I use it as a default. I go would, to that. Would you, would, you say, would, would you say, if you ask the dentist, what, what is your top three problems with a direct MOD composite? Contact? Yeah. Contact? <laughs> contact is, 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 a, is an issue, and the problem is you don't know you don't have it until the end of the visit, and you ask your assistant for the floss, and you just hope there's some contact there, because if there isn't, you're dead. Um, 
But the other one would be, uh, and that's my next step, is, is adhesion. Once you've set your matrix in, in place, uh, the next thing, of course, is, is uh, placing the adhesive. Um, whether it's a etch and rinse or a self-etch, uh, the fact of the matter is um, etch and rinse is a little bit more exacting. It's not hard by any means, but you have to, you can't over etch, you can't under prime, and, and, and you, you just well, have go, to do it right. And you go through, but, go, but go through that technique. Would you fill up the whole thing with? Well, you start on the enamel first, because enamel needs a minimum of 15 seconds. Um, uh, and, and here's the problem with dentists in the past getting post-operative sensitivity following placement of a, post, a posterior composite is sometimes they'd over etch. Uh, they'd fill up the tooth and, and then they just wait and, and they guess at 15 seconds. Well, you can't guess at 15 seconds. Um, that's ridiculous. So my suggestion is you start on the enamel with the acid um, because you can't over etch enamel. Uh, if it's longer than 15, 20, 25 seconds, it doesn't matter. Um, and after you've done the enamel first, then you fill up the tooth and at that point, you can count to about 12, and that guarantees that the enamel gets 15 plus seconds and the dentin 15 minus seconds. Um, you know, and then again, you have to wash it off in achieving the right, because etch and rinse uh, adhesion uh, is wet bonding. We're bonding to wet dentin, and, and uh, another problem dentists had was, well, how wet is wet? In, in establishing that moisture content of dentin, um, that, that the primer is attracted to. So uh, after you wash it off, you blocked to a certain moisture content. No water on the surface, but clearly the dentin is not dry. So that's a, that's a point. The third point is applying the primer. You can under prime, and a lot of dentists would do that too. They would just put one coat on, and then they'd grab the air syringe because they say dry it, and they'd blast it. And when they blasted it with air, uh, they'd blow the primer off the tooth. And it'd be more primer on the wall than in the tooth. And so uh, I, I happen to watch all these mistakes being made uh, as I taught my courses at LVI, dentists doing live patient courses. You get to see what they're doing, and they make these mistakes without even knowing it. So you don't want to under prime. And I always ad advise put on one coat of primer, agitate for 10 seconds, dry it, and then apply another coat. So once you've done that, what brand? Uh, if you're going to use an, uh, an etch and rinse adhesive, there's 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 two categories: three-step etch and rinse adhesive, which might be Scotch Bond uh, MP uh, multi-purpose. If you're going to use that's 3M, right? That's 3M Scotch Bond 3M. If you're going to use a, um, um, uh, or you, you've got another one under under etch and rinse too, and that would be Optibond FL. That's Kurs. And that is oftentimes considered like the gold standard. The research uses that oftentimes as the control Optibond FL three-step etch and rinse adhesive. And what generation is that? Three of those well, three those steps. Well, would be fourth, but I. I but you I, don't like those terms. I don't like the term generation. I'd rather call it a three-step etch and rinse adhesive. How many steps are there in a three-step etch and rinse adhesive? <laughs> three. You know. <laughs> And what is it? Well, it's etch and rinse. So you see, you, you, you call it by what you're doing with it and how you handle it rather than some stupid generation name. Now, as far as two-step etch and rinse, uh, you've got multiple uh, materials there. You, you've got uh, uh, 3M's uh, also has a, a, a single bond. Um, uh, Optibond Solo Plus would be uh, Kurs. You've got Bisco's uh, uh, One Step Plus. Um, you, you've got lots of different ones there, and I'm leaving a lot of them out. Uh, but nevertheless, there's an example of them. Now, the other thing to do is go self etch. I tell dentists if you're going to have a problem, if after trying to do it correctly and you still have a problem, your fallback position would be a self etch adhesive. Uh, Two-step self-etch adhesive uh, might be Clearfill SE Bond or uh, Protect Bond, that's Curare. Um, um, XTR, Optibond XTR, that's a Cur product, so there's, there's a bunch of them in that uh, uh, two-step uh, self-etch. Um, the, the other thing about doing a self-etch, though, uh, the research shows this very clearly, and I recommend the dentist selective etch the enamel. Selective etch the clusal enamel um, first, and then use the adhesive exactly the way the manufacturer uh, states. 
Now, you, with, with Optobon XTR, that's a Kerr product, the one I mentioned a moment ago, you don't necessarily have to etch uh, the enamel. Research has shown that um, it does, in fact, etch enamel adequately without the use of selective etch. But any other self-etch product out there, I recommend selective etching the enamel first, including the new universals. You know, there's a whole group now of, of universals, and they are coming on strong. Research is showing these things are different um, than the one-step self-etchers in the past. Um, and um, uh, it, it's, it, it, some may actually already be proven enough to be confident to go ahead and use them. It, although there's a lack of clinical trials on them, a lot of research is showing these materials are different uh, than the historical adhesives. So anyway, after you've done the adhesive, when it gets to putting the composite in... Well, wait, I'm going I'm to stop you right there. Again, what, yeah, yeah, what do you use? Ron Jackson in Middleburg, Virginia. I'm using Kerr's Optibon XTR. Which, which is, you said, the gold standard. Uh, well, Optibon FL... Is the gold uh, standard. ...was the gold standard, and that's what I used for many years. But uh, actually, but, Howard, I, I use the, the, a number of products because I have to know about them in order to teach them. Uh, and, and that, but I did use Optibon FL uh, pretty much exclusively for my directs for many years. XTR now uh, is also a Kerr product. Uh, and, um, but Clearfill SE, I use that for a long time. Uh, a self-etch product, a two-step self-etch by Curare. I use that for many years as well. Um, and XTR is classified as a universal, um, and I tend to use that quite a lot now. What does the XTR stand for? Uh. Extraterrestrial <laughs> resin. <laughs> Extra retention, I guess. I'm, you so, know, I but, really but, don't but, know. But, Doc, would it be fair to say that the... Um, the um, you know, like the Clearfill SE or the um, um, Optibon XTR, that those have less sensitivity because they're less technique sensitive? Yeah, uh, self etchers, self etchers are uh, what makes them uh, less technique sensitive is the fact that you can't over etch and you can't under prime. Two of the most common mistakes dentists make. Also, there's no issue with trying to figure out what constitutes wet dentin or wet bonding. You don't bother with that with, with self etchers. So, so there is less um, uh, landmines, if you will. It's, it's a little less exacting. Um, both work very well. I should mention um, that the, you know, we got into brand names and we're talking about what I use, but I, I also want to make it clear that uh, there's so many good adhesives in the marketplace. There really are that what's more important is the dentist and the dentist doing it correctly, whichever class they use. Um, I, I just feel that they're getting simpler and this is where this new group of universals, the whole, the whole premise behind a universal adhesive, why do we have them, is because what we would like, you and I, dentists practicing in the trenches, we'd like one adhesive that does direct, indirect, you can bond a post, you can repair porcelain. In other words, we'd like to have one adhesive where we use it the same way every time. The protocol doesn't change, no matter what you're doing, and you do it for everything. And that's where these universals are going. That's a further simplification. A recent survey that I saw about dentists was that most have two different adhesives. Some have three different adhesives, depending on what they're doing. Well. That's that's complexity right there. The assistant has to figure out, well, let's see, which one do I get off the shelf today? And, and the dentist then has to remember the different protocols for all the different uh, adhesives. So uh, we're headed in the right direction. We, When it comes to success with posterior composites, and that's where we started with this, simplifying the procedure, making it more predictable, we now have contact uh, instruments of the instrumentation, these, these sectional matrix systems that give us the contact, so that worry is gone. We've got better adhesives that are simplified, and that worry is either gone or going, depending on the dentist. Most, most dentists don't have any postoperative sensitivity anymore. They've learned how to conquer this problem. They've learned the mistakes, and they've gone to courses, and the materials have gotten better. 
the third part of the uh, well, can, I like I, can, I, can I can I can I back yeah. up on the adhesive one on more adhesion. time? Yeah, back to adhesion. Um, how do all these bonding agents work when they're before the dentist is doing adhesion? They're using other products, uh, like they might use um, Paradex to rinse off the press, or chlorhexidine gluconate, or some um, rehydrate it with uh, tubeless and red. So, um, so some people say, well, here's an exact chemistry set. That was designed for dentin and enamel, but before you even get the dam enamel, you're you're putting, uh, um, you know, other other chemicals on the tooth. D is that could that interfere with the bonding? Do you do you use chlorhexidine to clean out the prep? Do you use tubeless and red? Do you have other things that you're not talking about in between the prep and you start doing adhesive dentistry? When it uh, that that's a very good question, by the way, and I'll I'll, I'll try to answer it in a short time without getting too complex. The, the, the short answer is if I'm doing etch and rinse adhesion, if I'm using an etch and rinse adhesive where the phosphoric acid is etching the dentin, following that either chlorhexidine, uh, glutaraldehyde and a product, a common one is called Bluma, but Clinician's Choice has one G5 and Danville uh, has one microprime. Uh, which are lower in cost, the same thing. They're a 5% glutaraldehyde and, and a, a primer. They call these things desensitizers, but the active ingredient is, is the glutaraldehyde. So an etch and rinse adhesive, after you wash the acid off and you've blot, blotted it to a certain moisture level, you can add either the glutaraldehyde or you can do a chlorhexidine. Neither one will, or if you want to use the uh, your uh, tubeless is red is a benzylconium chloride. That, that's a very good antimicrobial. If you want to use those, uh, fine. You would use them after you etch uh, the dentin um, there. Generally, I think if you just use the glutaraldehyde, you, you, you've covered all your bases. Uh, but they do not, inter none of those three products that we just mentioned interfere with adhesion. Now, when it comes to the self etch products, um, it's a little controversial there. There's not agreement in the literature um, whether those things do any good or not um, in terms of uh, improving the dentin bond durability because that's what we're talking about here and dealing with bacterial component. But certainly you would use them before you use a self-etch primer uh, in, in the case of using self-etchers because you, you, you can't put it between the self-etch primer and the, and the second bottle which is the bond resin. Um, but they also, if you use them before the uh, uh, self-etch adhesive, um, they're not going to interfere with the bond either. So we have science on that. It, the question is whether they actually are, are going to do you any good in the self-etch category. In the etch and rinse, yes, I do recommend. Um, and, so and, what, and what do you exactly recommend? The glutaraldehyde? The I use glutaraldehyde. Microprime uh, from Danville or uh, G5 from Clinician's Choice. Exactly the same as Gluma, half the cost. Right the on. on Gluma is, has expired, and so other manufacturers are making it at a cheaper price. But Gluma is still used by a lot of dentists, and it, they're all the same. Okay, so I'll stop interrupting you. Now you can go to the third okay. part uh, of the, the, direct, the, uh, fill, part, the filling. The third part is, is I wanted to get to that because this, I think, is the, uh, well, it's kind of exciting and it's the newest part. Our problem with, with this whole posterior composites is there's three parts to it. The contact issue, the adhesive issue, and placement issue. And the placement has been where we start with a low viscosity liner, either a flowable or a low viscosity resin ionomer like a Vitrobon. We, we, we start the process with something like that to get adaptation to the pulpal floor and to fill in the undercuts. Um, then we place multiple two millimeter increments. Now each increment has to be carefully adapted intimately to the cavity walls and cured. And we'd end up with two, three, four, maybe five increments. I mean, it would take so long, and it was tedious and time-consuming, and it's very exacting. If you don't get it well adapted, you're going to have uh, gaps and seams and micro leakage and all these things. So uh, the real time-consuming, tedious part has, has been the actual placement. 
up until about five years ago. Our, as I mentioned at the start of this, our, our composite materials, I take my hat off to the manufacturers, and I, I'm talking about multiple manufacturers here, all the big names for sure, Ivoclar and Kerr and, and Carrari and, and 3M and all of the, 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 the manufacturers come out. Uh, these materials have gotten so highly filled and so strong and wear resistant um, that, that they're, they're wonderful, but they still require this tedious layering lining and layering I call it technique so manufacturers five years ago turned their attention to making it faster by creating what's called bulk fill meaning you can place now four millimeters even five with one of the products out there sonic fill and so at this point um, we can we can uh, do this process faster and easier and in far less time and and we need to get to that point you talked about bringing this to the masses well uh, henry ford said that it, you know until technology is available to the masses it's just an interesting uh, curiosity uh, and and you're talking about in in countries like africa and all these other places uh where you know they're lucky to have dentistry it it, it, it you know uh, yes i agree that maybe some of this kind of dentistry we're talking about is a ways off working there but here in our country and in developed countries um we've got to make it uh, uh, again for the masses and what we're seeing now your own dental town uh i've got it right in front of me the last issue you had a question in your survey, your poll section, um, uh, asking, you said, do you place bulk fill composite restorations in your practice? 53% of your people responded yes, uh, which is a little larger than the uh, other surveys of our profession right now, but it's probably because you, 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 uh, your, your people are really on top of things. Um, so that's over half now of, of dental towners that are using bulk fill materials. Uh, the other half that aren't uh, said they don't trust the technology uh, is the main reason for, for not doing it. Well, I've got good news for them. And, and to this, I listened to Gordon's, um, your interview with him a few months ago. And, um, and Gordon was a, uh, a he, he's been a little slow in this area uh, to embrace uh, the bulk fills. And, and um, uh, here is where uh, you talk about disagreeing with God. I mean, my Lord, I don't do, I tread very lightly right now, but in fact, the science on bulk fills is showing that indeed, across the board, they're meeting uh, manufacturers' claims. Uh, right now, in three of the journals that I get, Dental Materials and Journal of Dentistry and Journal of Adhesive Dentistry, every month there's two, at least two articles on bulk fills, and, and over the last 12 months, they're rolling out like crazy. The research community has realized that, that uh, clinicians are using these now, and they're growing like crazy out there, and they represent uh, almost 30% of the mass market now. Uh, are using bulk fills for posterior composites. Your people are, as I said, over 50% using it, uh, bulk fills versus the layered. Um, and so consequently, they're here, they're working, and the science is proving them out uh, across the board. The one issue is obviously with bulk fills, well, there's not one, it's two, depth of cure and shrinkage stress. If you're going to put in a big wad of composite into a tooth and you're going to bond it to that tooth, is the shrinkage stress going to break the tooth or break the bond? And the other thing is, is your light going to cure through that thick of material? Because historically we've been taught this can't be done and historically that was true. I think with the uh, listeners and uh, people that I talk to and, and teach to need to understand is that these materials are different. Manufacturers, have, there's been a breakthrough. They're changing the way they plumberize. They're changing photo initiators. These are not the same composites that we've been using. They're the same in the basic chemical platform, methacrylates, filler particles, highly filled materials. So in terms of performance, they will perform like the others. They also are as I said, methacrylate, so they'll 
they'll work with any bonding agent and they work with each other they work with any the thing is they have uh, uh, changed the way they polymerize or they've changed the um, uh, polymerization kinetics of these things and they're working uh, I could I could drown you with 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 scientific references but I, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere um, they fall into two categories Howard and this is, comes a personal choice either the flowable ones and the first one in that category was uh, dense flies SDR flow I don't know if you're familiar with that but they were the first company to come out with a what's called a flowable base four millimeters of a flowable you know you're basically replacing the the dentin with the flowable and certainly not strong enough for occlusal forces so after you put four millimeters of flowable in there which adapts very well because it's flowable you cure it and they've controlled the shrinkage stress and that works um, five years into it there's no question about that anymore and then you put a regular composite two millimeters on top fine there's a whole category of those flowables I can name a bunch of other ones as well the other category are the high viscosity um, uh, bulk fill flow uh, materials they're they're restorative composites they're not flowable at all they're extremely thick and viscous all but one of those requires a flowable be placed first uh, in my opinion and even in the opinion of research that I could quote because they're so thick and viscous that trying to adapt them into the internal walls of the cavity is, is difficult you end up getting some gaps or whatever so you put a flowable first then you put four millimeters of composite shaded composite on top of it those are the two categories <clears throat> I, uh, if we've got a, a couple more minutes, I'd like to Absolutely. focus Absolutely. We've got all the time you want. Well, what I use um, there, by the way, I've used them all, and they all work. Every one of them shortens the time, at least a third. And, and more importantly, Howard, when you get old like me, you're, not, you're still young, but when you get old like me, it lessens the work. Uh, the effort you know you put in a quadrant of composites you put in a you know five six eight composites a day and this is the most common performed procedure is posterior direct restorations in dentistry uh, general dentist uh, you know that's the most common procedure you do a bunch of those in a day you're tired at the end of the day I've had dentists say you asked about an MOD I've had dentists say that it's easier to do a crown you know, is less, less, less great. Don't you think that was even a big driving force of uh, the CAD CAM revolution? Because, yes. because no why, why do you want to work for an hour yep. and have insurance give you almost no money yep. when you could do a, your do a Syrac indirect. and bill yep. out an indirect and and bill out a lot more and make it out of the mouth? I, I, I think a, you agree that's a huge driver of CAD CAM. I do. I agree. And, what and would you say the average CAD CAM cost is versus uh, direct? I mean, as far as what they're billing out for the patient. Well, I mean, an indirect will, can bill out eight, eight hundred, twelve hundred, anywhere in that range. Uh, and a direct, and a, a direct. direct is, you know, you're going to get two hundred and fifty dollars, maybe three hundred, right. depending right. on the practice. I mean, yeah. you're going to you're going to put in almost the same amount of time, and that's why this 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 placement, this third leg of the stool, if you will after you've got the contact and adhesion the third leg being the placement issue needed simplification it needed to be speeded up without compromising quality and that's what these companies have done with the bulk fill that's why dentists are moving to them um, is they can actually place a restoration at the insurance fee you know a lot of dentists placing posterior composites at an insurance fee are making less money on that restoration than if they did the amalgam the difference in the uh, insurance reimbursement for a composite does not between a composite and amalgam that difference that the insurance pays that little bit of more that they pay nowhere near compensate the dentist for the time and effort of placing the composite and the materials it's, yeah and so so we, we needed this and that's why I applaud these companies and 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 dentists are finding this out and uh, I know uh, Gordon still has concerns about depth of cure and shrinkage stress, but the science is there. In fact, his own newsletter in January of 2012, he reported uh, in the CR newsletter depth of cure of, a, of, of I guess, about five or six different uh, bulk fills. 
and all of them he showed uh, met the company's uh, specifications or claims of, of depth of cure. Uh, so I, I, um, I think he'll come around. I think he's doing it now, actually, because he's usually, he's usually on the front lines when it comes to efficiency. Uh, Gordon works with two assistants. He's a terrific dentist. He's a terrific person. Uh, I've admired him and learned from him for years. Um, but I've, I know that he's been a little slow in embracing this, and, and, and I can understand that because it goes against what we've all been taught for years. But, but these, they really have accomplished breakthroughs, and, and much like we did with adhesion when it came to bonding to dentin, and we started putting phosphoric acid on dentin, and for I don't know how many decades we were told you couldn't do that, and then all of a sudden we're all doing it. But I think this is going to be the same with bulk fills. But I want to talk about the last one, and here I want to make a disclosure. Um, sonic fill. I, I want to disclose that I acted as a paid consultant in the development of Sonic Phil, uh, and I still have a financial interest in the product. Uh, Kerr invited me about uh, I don't know six years ago, uh, and this isn't the first composite that I've worked for companies in developing um, uh, a material, new material. Uh, this was uh, certainly a breakthrough material because what Sonic Phil does is it uses sonic energy. You use a, uh, a sonic handpiece, you get high frequency vibration, and it lowers the viscosity of the material. There's, there's special modifiers in the composite, and that uh, is very responsive to shear stress, which is what high frequency vibration is. And, and it's 84% filled, so it's a very thick, viscous uh, composite. That sonic energy drops it instantaneously 87% in viscosity, almost to a flowable. So, and who makes really, that? Pardon me. Who makes Sonic Fill? Kerr. 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 Um, so the the uh, I, I I was privileged to work with brilliant uh, polymer chemists and hand handpiece engineers. I was just the token dentist on this team, but of course I'm the one that works with the material. They they don't really work with it, but uh, it, it was an incredible sort of experience. Uh, because it was new technology, uh, and it, so it lowers the viscosity 87 percent. So it's going in; it's literally being vibrated into the tooth. You know how we pour models? How do we pour a model? We vibrate stone into the model. What does the vibration do? Gives you adaptation. Gets rid of the voids. That's exactly what we're doing. We're lowering the viscosity of the material, which starts out at a high viscosity, thick material, lowers it down to the flowable level, vibrates it into the tooth fills it, and Sonicville has a five millimeter depth of cure, one more millimeter than all the other ones uh, out there. And why is that important? Well, 80% of the cavities are five millimeters or less. What it means is 80% of the cavities can be filled in one fast shot, and it literally will fill a five millimeter cavity in your MOD in about five seconds or less. It does not return to a very high viscosity immediately when you, when you stop the handpiece. When you take your foot off the foot pedal, it slowly returns to a high viscosity. And that's important that it retain the energy because you are going to sculpt this while it's still somewhat soft, non-sticky because it's vibrating. You sculpt it and it doesn't slump even though it's somewhat uh, soft and as I said it's totally non-sticky because of the vibration. You are going to cure this material um, while it's still energized. So it, it, the curve, the return uh, to the uh, original state takes about 15 minutes. Well you're going you're gonna to sculpt and cure this uh, within a minute or two at the most. So you're curing it while the energy is still there. That's what gives it its five millimeter depth of cure, and it's also what causes it to really be the lowest shrinkage. Uh, and by the way, the data I'm quoting now, I, wanna, I, I do want to reference this one. This will be the only study I'll reference. The American Dental Association has a laboratory uh, in Chicago. I don't know if dentists know this, but we, our dues pay for um, the research lab that the, that the American Dental Association has. And I'm totally in favor of it. I, I think it's wonderful uh, because it's independent research. In fact, the, the ADA 
buys the material in the marketplace. They won't even let manufacturers donate the material. And their studies, when they're doing them, manufacturers don't even know they're done until they're published. Uh, and they publish everything. So it's, a, it's really an arm's length. It's totally independent data. Well, October of 2013, a year and a half ago, um, and they publish this four times a year, their, their, their research. A year and a half ago, the research was on bulk fills, the ones that were in the marketplace at that time. And they compared them to standard layered composites. And the data is really remarkable. And I reference that one all the time because in their data, they show, and this is the ADA, they showed that Sonicville actually uh, uh, not only cures to five millimeters, they agreed with Gordon in his CR report that it cures to six. It actually goes a millimeter more than five, but uh, for safety, give you that margin of safety, Kerr recommends five instead of six. But all the others also met the manufacturer's claims in depth of cure, shrinkage stress. All the bulk fills compared to two uh, very um, uh, popular la layered composites, all the bulk fills had shrinkage stress in the same range of our, our typical materials placed at two millimeters and the bulk fills being placed at four or in the case of sonic fill five. So you had a situation here where where it met specifications also on shrinkage stress, except one material extra from um, Voco uh, had a, uh, a little higher shrinkage stress than all the others. But what was interesting, uh, if, if you don't mind me bragging a bit, uh, although I didn't have anything much to do with it, um, Sonicville had a significantly less than all the other ones. It was, it was, so there were two that one was significantly higher, the other uh, sonic fill significantly less. Otherwise, the, bulk, the rest of the bulk fills were in range of normal. So the bottom line is you, you have an ADA independent uh, paper uh, studying the physical properties of these materials, showing they have the high strength characteristics and they actually meet manufacturers' claims. And that pretty much uh, it, it should dispel uh, dentist concerns, I think, about whether or not these represent a new class of materials. They really do. And they shorten it. Sonicville, for instance, because it doesn't require a liner and it doesn't require a second capping layer on top, um, shortens it close to 50% of the time. And it vibrates in the tooth so you get good adaptation. Um, it, it, they're all worthwhile. They're all uh, effective. And they're being used well. And they're performing well. Uh, this one, uh, the sonic uh, handpiece activation, uh, is just in a class by itself, and, it, and it's proving very popular. So, are you? Are you? Um, th is that your choice in for your direct? Yes. Uh, post here, you're doing Kerr Solo Plus bonding agent with uh, Kerr Sonafil. Not the Solo Plus bonding agent, uh, really. I would be using uh, the XTR. Or oh, okay, the XTR. Okay, the XTR. Okay. Yeah, I used to use the Optibond FL um, there, and um, so you're using the Kerr um, Optibond XTR. Yes, and we think it stands for extraterrestrial resin. We're not sure. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, and then you're using the Sonic Fill. Yeah, I I, I like the Sonic Fill. I, yeah. I I think it's fantastic. Um, okay, so then uh, so you mentioned uh, CR clinical research with a. Uh, Gordon Christian and CRA, you mentioned ADA research. Um, any other research that you pay attention to? The, we see Cochrane, we see uh, Michael Miller Reality. Any, any other things that you read a yeah. lot? Well, uh, uh, Dental Advisor, yes. Both dental both Advisor? Reality and Dental Advisor um, <coughs> have come up with the same kind of data. Um, I, I've got Probably, I'm in the process right now, so all this is kind of on the tip of my tongue of writing a, a, a an article for the British Dental Journal on uh, posterior composites, uh, mainly uh, the the placement process and an emphasis on the bulk fills. So I've just done my literature search on this, and I was blown away the number of of papers uh, that uh, have come out confirming. Um, uh, Sonic Phil plus all the other ones too. It's just a question of, uh, you know, they're all working well. So only the British get this article. The Americans aren't going to get it with Dentaltown Magazine. Well, I've I've, <laughs> I've actually uh, written three or four of them for American 
uh, our journals too. And this one is a I don't know they just a good friend of mine is editing uh, the this particular special issue of the British Dental Journal, and he asked me to do it. But very likely it'll get reprinted in in one of our journals. Well, I hope it's Dental Town and. Uh Let's um, and then I also want to ask you about the light cure. You're you're talking about the light cure. Does the light matter? Are there any oh, any any types yeah. of lights that are better than others? Yes, I, I, absolutely, Howard. Boy, I'm glad you mentioned this because I've it's something I um, really spend time more time on now in lectures. And and to be fair to Gordon, this is where he's concerned about. Um, uh, I've I've had feedback uh, why he's a bit concerned about ball fills is more the uh, curing depth. And his worry is that dentists uh, using lights, inadequate lights, and and quite frankly, there's they're still out there. And I, I try to shame my audience uh, carefully. I try to phrase it as a joke. I'm not as good as you are at at, at jokes, but but I um, I, I tell dentists if they're using a curing, if they have in their pocket uh, the latest smartphone. And they're curing their composites with a light that uh, was developed in the last century. Then they're an idiot. I mean, it, 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 dentists have really got to quit using halogen lights. They need to go out and buy these high-quality uh, LED lights. Minimum output of a thousand milliwatts per centimeter squared. Most of them are going up to twelve to eighteen hundred. Uh, uh, there, there's several of them out there. Again, N uh, name some. The majors uh, 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 out there would be, well, actually, Kerr has one. Um, um, the um, oh, um, Thermotron Plus, the uh, 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 Ivoclar, and I say it Ivoclar, Ivoclar, it depends on whether you're on this side of the ocean or not. They've got three really good curing lights out there. Um, Do you know their names? Yeah. So, sorry? Do you know the Ivoclar names of the curing lights? or? Yes, um, I do. Um, uh, the twenty i. Uh, there's a brand new one out now that I don't know why it's too bad. To, you know, when you get sixty eight, this is one of the things that's going now. It's not that my memory isn't there anymore. It's just on delay. Um, but the twenty i is is a very effective one. Uh, the oh, the style one called the style. Ultradent has one called Velo. Um, uh, Densply uh, has light, and so does uh, 3M. Um, is Densply is that out of their cock division? Yes, yes. The, the cock There's division. Kind of cock division. Now, Ron, uh, do you smart, think it's okay for smart light? I just. Do you think it's, it's okay for me? I I use the lightsaber to prep and cure the composite. My my Star Wars lightsaber that I got from that I got from Darth Vader. Oh. It cuts the tooth and it yeah. cures. No, um, okay. So you're using laser. Oh, I just thought of the the cur is the demi plus, not the demitron plus. They call it the demi plus. Um, but all those ones I just mentioned, used correctly. Um, first of all, using high output like that um, gives you uh, it saves you time. You cut the time in half. Um, you're going to get uh, better, deeper cures. You have to use the light correctly. Um, uh, oftentimes dentists delegate this to their assistants and they don't watch what their assistant's doing. If that light is not, if that beam isn't perpendicular to the target, it's not going to cure it. Um, if it's waving around, I, I, I can't believe what I would see sometimes. The dentist would just say, okay, now light cure, and then you know, not even watch what's going on, not paying attention, sometimes hasn't even instructed the assistant properly about how the light has to be. It's photons coming out of that light guide are like bullets coming out of a gun. It, it, you want to be perpendicular to the target. If you're in an oblique angle, it's going to careem off the target. You'll reduce the energy by 50% sometimes just by coming in at the wrong angle. So, hey, Could you say the same about a sun... A Sun tanning that you know that when it's 12 noon you're getting burned, but at 8 in the morning and 8 p.m. You, it's it's not really doing anything. If you don't mind, I'm going to steal that analogy. That's perfect. Um, That's I, per can I? Uh, I only got you for. I'm, I'm almost out of time, but, but yeah. I, 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 if I if I was going to take anybody to overtime, if you got extra time, I, I, I'd love to steal you. I, I want to take a, a whole nother direction with this because um, you and I have lectured around the world and. 
Um, some countries are more into glass onomer and yes. and Americans aren't. And some a lot of people um, say that you know that everything you've said. It almost sounds like you're a civil engineer. You're building a building. You're building a bridge. You're building a house. And in the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you build your barn because the barn's going to be taken out by termites. And if you would have built a aluminum barn when the termites came back, they couldn't have eaten anything. And some people think that all restorative materials should be bioactive. They should have some type of active ingredient to try to kill um, the bugs that are going to come back. When when someone has uh, a a too big a big cavity that needs an mod and no matter how we fix it we didn't change their behavior they didn't stop drinking mountain dew they didn't start <laughs> they didn't buy a sonic hair and start flossing and then start and, you know they, we didn't change their behavior right. so so they they walk out of this office with a new filling and it's still your uncle eddie who's got a mountain dew in his hand and doesn't know what floss is um so what about active ingredients what about glass armor do you think glass ionomers um would 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 last longer because they try to fight the biological side as opposed to the engineering side would you consider yourself a biological dentist trying to kill bacteria or more of a civil engineer dentist trying to build a structure well it's a it's a good point and i i see the frontier the next frontier is certainly more bioactive materials no question about it and you're right glass honor by the way two i just got back from australia and new zealand two weeks ago um and uh if you don't at least mention uh, glass ionomer from the podium. They'll they'll, they'll give you the hook. Um, there, they're, they're they're into it to such a degree. And, and just for the audience perspective, because I've lectured there several times, going back in August, what percent more glass ionomer do you think they use than Americans in Australia? I don't know, really. I'd but it's a lot. Say, you... I, I know they all ask me about it, and there's nothing wrong with putting it in. Now it's not streamlining the procedure. Glass ionomer. And by the way, when we say glass ionomer, I'm talking about the acid base uh, reaction. I'm talking about the auto cure glass ionomer. And I'm, uh, I'm not talking about resin ionomers, light cured glass ionomers that have resin in them. Yes, they claim to give off fluoride, and they do. But there's been no research showing that the fluoride that resin ionomers give off actually is effective. Uh, but there has been with uh, auto cure glass ionomer. So let, let's separate those two materials. Okay. Could, so so name, name the so what what is the the auto cured? Are you talking about Fuji? Fuji nine, Fu, Fuji 9 let's say Fuji nine uh, is a, um, a it, material that I use um, uh, for my geriatric dentistry root caries and this sort of stuff. Where where we're not dealing with aesthetics, we're not dealing with engineering. Uh, those areas don't get stressed down on root caries, and so we're we're using the biological or the the bioactive aspects of it there. Um, the the issue with glass ionomers and the reason why in in Western countries other than Australia, New Zealand, Europe, uh, and and North America uh, is using less of those things is is because of the engineering side of the, of the equation and just as much also the time side of the equation. When you're putting in auto cure glass ionomer as a base, you've got to wait for that to set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, but let's talk a little bit too about the engineering because if you place a rubber dam and you do your adhesion correctly and you get total adaptation of your composite to the cavity walls, and I'm talking about the external margins, proximal box margins, because that's what you're concerned with. You're worried about new decay because of the Mountain Dew on these gingival margins in the proximal area. But if you seal that tooth, bacteria can't get in. I mean, that goes back to the, 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 one of the biggest reasons why I use the rubber dam and isolation is so important. Any compromise there and you, and you have a problem. Now, glass ionomer will make up for that to a certain degree, but it also has a problem with moisture. You still have to maintain it to a certain degree. But I, I, I don't have anything against, I don't want to talk down glass ionomer because I don't have anything against it. Um, it it's going to take even more time to do your your your, your uh, uh, posterior composite restoration using a glass ionomer basis, and 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 that's why I think that the American market and the European market is is we're we're not being paid for all that time. In fact, we're being penalized for that. So so what I see now, and you're right, you separated these very nicely, bioactive from engineering. What we need to do is bring those two together. 
we need a bioactive material and continue putting in well-engineered restorations that are strong and durable and last and can be placed in, a, in an expedient, efficient way. Not, 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 not a if it's time-consuming, Howard, and it, they're going to cut the crown. They're, they're not going to put in the composite. They're yeah, and, and again, I think the butcher the two, and 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 that's worse. So at this stage of the game, I, I feel a well-engineered, well-bonded, sealed restoration done under isolation is the way to go, and it's expedient. And that's why dentists have flocked to this bulk fill uh, area is because of because of that. The next thing we need to do is make that same material bioactive. In the in the vein of a glass honor, but I, I have ideas, thoughts on this, and there's work being done on this um, uh, to make it even more so. Uh, not only will it be antimicrobial, but it'll also be uh, uh, stimulating to the pulp. It'll actually recreate dentin, which is what we really want. So the future, you know, you ask. Here I am at 68, and I'm still practicing dentistry. I'm still into this field as much as I've ever been into this field. And I have every intention of staying into this field because I can't wait to see what's happening next. And I want to be involved in it and 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 be part of it and and uh, uh, you know be doing it for my patients and uh, and talking about it to other dentists like yourself on programs like this. Well, I'll tell you. Um you know, you were with LVI for, what, 18 years before yeah. uh, you retired from them? I We have 307 courses up there, and I wish you would validate us someday by putting a, a, a course or a curriculum uh, on there because you're a legend. You were my idol back in 95. Oh. I, I got out of school in 87, and I remember going to LVI when it was uh, in Bill's office with Hornbrook yep. and, and a little dental office. And uh, I don't know how many times I've seen you lecture getting my FAGD, MAGD, but the, the neat thing about you is not only do you have all the knowledge, and you know, Einstein said, if you can't explain uh, your subject matter, it's because you don't understand the subject matter. And God dang it, uh, you're just a down to earth guy from Virginia and you could explain it to me uh, from for forever. And for that, I thank you. And uh, every one of my friends, when I told them last night I was uh, interviewing you today, they were just like, they just beamed near to ear. Uh, oh, you're you're you. a, you're my uh, you're just an amazing guy. Uh, thank you so much for all you've done for dentistry. Thank you so much for all you've done for the cosmetic revolution and the fact you spent an hour with me today. Just uh, thank you so much, Ron. Well, it's been my pleasure, Howard. It really truly has. Thanks for inviting me to be participant in your podcast. Well, if you ever want to do another one, you just email me, Howard at dentaltown.com, and we'll set it up. Okay, Howard. Thanks. All right. Bye, bye, all Ron. Right. Bye, bye. Bye, everybody.